So the way that we want to really navigate today is we're going to invite Dr. Hassan and Dr. Rahimullah to address some of these, you know, questions that we had. We had prepared these questions based on, you know, a lot of what we saw from our communities, responses on social media about addiction. And it seems to be a very hot topic, of course, and I'm sure Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Ahmed will walk us through that. But I'm really going to pose it as more of a Q&A. So I'm going to pose questions to both our speakers and we'll hear a little bit from both of them. Um, in terms of, you know, their individual work with uh, within addiction. And then inshallah, we will take questions from the Q&A box. So if you do drop any questions and if you do drop questions in the Q&A box, I will try to pair them in um, and kind of consolidate them or I will tag them onto one of these six questions that we have on our screen. Um, again, we'll answer questions periodically throughout, but we won't really get to individual questions um, or the utilization of the microphone until after uh, we've gone through these six major questions with our speakers inshallah. So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our speakers. So Dr. Ahmed Hassan, who's a clinical scientist and addiction psychiatrist at Canada Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for joining us today. And Dr. Amr Rahimullah, who is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He's the executive director of Medina House, a nonprofit organization focused on Muslims with substance abuse disorders. So with that, inshallah, we will invite both our speakers and we will go ahead and get started with our first question. So if, we would love to hear from both of you. And um, Dr. Ahmed, if you want to start us off, what is substance abuse when we talk about it in the context of our community and just overall from, um, you know, a medical perspective? Assalamu alaikum, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum. So, uh, substance, uh, what is substance abuse? That's the question, am I right? So, uh, substance abuse is basically it's a, it's, it's a behavior that can lead to, let's call it an addiction, or in a medical term, substance use disorder, uh, which I think we're all here because we're concerned about this uh, potential outcome. Uh, which can be defined as a, as a really, it's a condition uh, that leads to several diseases, uh, I, I would say. A lot of dysfunctional, biologically, psychologically, uh, and even uh, socially. Um, it, it, it might not start at this disease. Uh, a lot of people, there, there's different models of addiction, if you, if, even if in the scientific uh, community, and there's a lot of uh, debate and agreement is it a learner model, is it a, a disease model, is it, is it a moral model? But eventually, I can I, I, I see them as all in, in common at once. It does start with a behavior, uh, and all of us like do have sometimes do bad choices, but then with certain circumstances, certain uh, environment, um, and may, along with many other other factor, I can progress. Uh, repeatedly until the condition develops, which what we call substance use disorder. Uh, and that by itself, uh, then we, we left the initiation phase and going to maintenance uh, phase uh, that can lead to, yeah, several, I think there's, you want me, you want me to talk separately about the psychological or, or the consequences, so I'll leave that later. So in a nutshell, this is as, 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 uh, as we define, it's a condition and it's a chronic condition that relapses. That's formula that relapses. That means it has period where um, improvement, but also a period of decline. Um, that's the best I can describe it. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Dr. Ahmed, is there anything that you wanted to add? No, that's great. I'm so sorry. I think I, I <laughs> confused Dr. Ahmed with Dr. Hassan, and I took your question, Dr. Ahmed. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, no, no. That was an excellent answer. I have nothing to add. All right. So um, our second question is really um, if each of you can talk about the prevalence that you've seen in your work and your research um, about uh, the prevalence of substance use and abuse in our in our Muslim community um, and, you know, why in your you know, professional and expert opinion are Muslims turning towards substances um, and it seems to be happening more and more. So, Dr. Ahmed, did you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Muslims turning to substance use problems is really just based on when we look at protective factors and risk factors for drug use and 
and addiction, it's no different in the Muslim community. So a lot of data shows that faith participation, religious participation, high scores on spirituality all, are all protective of, of drug use and of addiction and are helpful from recovering from these problems as well. But, you know, when we talk about Islam, Muslims, it's a really low threshold to come into Islam. The only thing that takes you out of Islam is denying what brought you into Islam. And so when you have people in Islam, there's different levels of practice. So, you know, people will have different levels of engagement with Islam. And so in turn, they'll have different levels of utilizing that as a protective factor. But, but you know, put that aside, one of the most important risk, risk factors for drug and alcohol problems in our, in, our, in our day and age is just access. So the access to substances is just, you know, unlike anything that we've had before. If you look at nicotine or smoking, you know, when hundreds of years ago, when you had a hand roll cigarettes, you can only roll a certain amount. Smoking wasn't an issue as much of a wide scale global issue as it is now. I mean, now it's the number one preventable cause of death in the U.S. And so after then you see that these rolling machines come into play, you're able to produce thousands and thousands of cigarettes a minute, smoking access increases. Probably a better example is the opioid epidemic. So you have an opioid problem, but then now you have increased access to opioids. And as opioids access increases, now you have uh, increasing uses of opioids. You can literally see as prescription opioid increase, uh, prescribing increases, uh, treatment engagement in um, rehabs for opioid use disorder increases and opioid overdose death increases. It's all, you know, uh, aligned. And, uh, and so there's, there's like geographical access and then there's psychological access. So now what's interesting is that you have drugs that many people would just not try like heroin or crystal meth. And, but maybe they tried an opioid. So they may not try heroin, but they tried something like an opioid, which is, you know, medically similar. It's just a pill form of opiate that's prescribed, but uh, they won't try heroin, but it's, it's uh, less stigma around trying opioids or they won't try meth, but there's less stigma around trying stimulants. And so there's less of a barrier to entry into substance use problems because you have a lot of people that will have these medications prescribed to them, have it be sort of blessed by a physician, but you can still lose control over these types of substances. And then marijuana, of course, you know, you'll have people that will not use marijuana recreationally anymore. There's a whole slew of reasons why people use marijuana and the advertising isn't helpful, helping. Like in California, you, you drive down the highway, you see all these, Chicago, you drive down the highway, you see all these advertisements of what marijuana helps for. So you have this decreasing in these barriers to substances. You can get them instantly over your phone, uh, increased access. And we know with increased access, there's increased use in, in drug and alcohol problems. And then also stress. So stress, different forms of stress. So we have adverse childhood experiences. Many studies show that this is associated with higher likelihood of substance use problems later in life. So adverse childhood experiences like physical abuse, child abuse, emotional abuse, parental conflict, and other things. So when we say Muslims are at different levels of practice, it's important to recognize this is a half glass full situation. We don't look at that as an opportunity to criticize Muslims or judge Muslims. It's really an excellent opportunity that people have this sort of DNA to develop to help then treat the problem. So when you see Muslims turning to addiction, just in short, the short answer, Muslims turning to addiction, it's really just, I see a person with all of these protective factors and risk factors just coming together in a human being to make them more uh, susceptible to drug and alcohol problems. So, you know, a clear example is, let's say a Muslim growing up in a society that's plagued with drug and alcohol problems and increased access and or a community with increased access and they go through a stressful event, maybe a, a divorce 
Now that child, that teenager, he's going to be at a level of practice. You know, a seven-year-old is going to have a different understanding of Islam, a different practice of Islam than a 12-year-old, than an 18-year-old, than a 25-year-old. It's impossible to learn it all at once. So you have different levels of practice just simply through the way that life occurs. And then you have stressors that can occur. And in the, in the uh, you know, you can have this perfect storm of access stress and, and uh, existing to, to develop problems. Yeah, Mashallah, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for the very, you know, realistic, I think, um, reality that a lot of folks, you know, live, whether it's um, underprivileged um, communities, under-resourced communities, and um, just how the increase of access um, can really impact our Muslim brothers and sisters. Thank you. Dr. Hassan, was there anything that you wanted to add? No, I think I think Dr. Amir uh, d- described it a uh, very excellent, an excellent way. Um, it, it is uh, uh, so the risk factor can really be uh, summarized as a biological factor, psychological factor, and social factor. They really interact together. Uh, and and yes, like stress interacts, for example, with the availability, which is I think it's a huge uh, problem growing on. Um, uh, right now, not just the, the availability, but also the, the variety of things that you come on, like the cannabis the whole time is used, like exactly like what I'm to describe it, you have to roll a joint. Now it comes in a variety of uh, choices, edible, vaping, smoking, and, and it's it's very tempting because you see how it's advertising the colors and, and, and what it does and the dispensary everywhere, open late, <laughs> late hours, all of that play into a factor. We cannot ignore it. Uh, it does play a major a major factor. If you're asking specifically about prevalence, like numbers of how, how, how much of this is a problem, we do have lake of data that, that support this to really represent. And it's really, I think it will make a difference if, you're looking into Muslim into a Muslim countries uh, or Muslims in in Western countries, so that it's a lot of variability play. Stigma is a big thing that that's coming in the way from us to to get a number, but I can give you, I can give the whole audience a little bit of uh, uh, early release of result of our research that we're doing and we're preparing it for publication. Um, it's coming from a U- United States national uh, data uh, from the twenty thirteen. Um, so it's a little bit outdated. It's almost coming to ten years. So we we looked into uh, the Muslim population, which is not a lot. It's about three hundred seventy-two people, but we matched it with non-Muslim people on the same risk factor. That's exactly Dr. Amir would describe it. Not all of them, but a lot of majority. Maybe family history of addiction, uh, stress, uh, psychiatric disorder, and then we looked into the the, the prevalence. Uh, is it the same? So. The alcohol was um, uh, lower for, for sure. So in general, we, we, what we got a sense is about 11% uh, for problem with alcohol. We're talking about that, like alcohol use disorder, so the biggest problem or substance. So the, even though the people are Muslim or non-Muslims have the same risk factor, the Muslim have lower risk of developing alcohol, which was what we expected. Exactly like Dr. Amr said, there, we have tons of data to support that Spirituality or, or religio- religiosity actually uh, plays a protective factor. But other substance use were actually the same uh, prevalence as the population. And some people might just say, okay, that's okay, that's expected. Actually, that was not expected. That, that means there, it might be uh, showing a sign of a growing problem. Uh, the, the, if, if I think, me personally, I think that the filter uh, of the, the made the alcohol had a lower prevalence is not persistent. Maybe the way of how people perceive it or rationalize it in their head, um, and maybe they're debating is kind of halal or haram. Maybe if the other substance is abused or, or can be used, does it really uh, veil the brain or does not? Veil? So all of that might be playing the factors of, of what we see. The, the, sub, the, the substance that I think have been historically at high rate um, and still exists. Can you expect which substance would that be? How can you guess it? Tobacco. Right? So there's a big, we have a big problem in the Muslim countries and, and even in the Western. So it's about 18% of Muslims that said that, and it's higher than the general population. 
Uh, and it's probably, if, if we got to look at it from a, a spiritual lens, it's probably, again, is how Muslims perceive it. Like, I mean, this this still, maybe it's not doing the same harm or not the same harm, so it's coming into a, a different factor. So the, the, at the bottom line, there is a growing problem, and, there, and, and you need further investigation, but um, we can see definitely a variety of prevalence uh, across Muslim and across a variety of substance use as well. Sorry, I took a long <laughs> No, not at all, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. And you kind of alluded to the next question, which is if you can um, kind of support us as an audience in understanding the biological, behavioral, and environmental um, and social consequences that individuals who might struggle with a substance use disorder face. Um, if you don't mind talk, telling us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so you, you, you're you definitely some of oh, there's biological factors, psychological, social, even spiritual consequences. And usually these uh, consequences of factor is what we diagnose, how we diagnose um, a patient uh, in clinic uh, wise. Uh, it's not really about if the, how long is the patient, how long, let, let me say, how long is the individual using it or how much they use it. It's really about how much it affected the, the individual. Um, so biological part has to do something with actually the development. And for example, um, the, the, the addiction is, is really about learning. It's a learning association between uh, response cues, positive and negative reinforcement. Exactly like Dr. Amar was saying, it, it might be a stress. I take the substance, it goes away. That's a, like a reinforcement, a negative reinforcement. Or I, I took the substance, it made me high, it made me feel better. I'm, I'm going to use it. So that craving, the, the longer we use it, that's a biologically actually a problem because when we crave it, we, we taught our brain to think this way at the same time of, uh, of a trigger. Uh, any stress is means equal substance. So that, that's a biological consequences. Another one is what we call tolerance. So um, <clears throat> most substances really hijack the brain reward system and it might change some physiological changes. That means it changed chemical on the, on the cellular level, meaning... Um, after a while of using the, the substance, or even maybe a short while. Oh, am I still on? Yeah, yeah, you're still here. We, I think okay. we just updated this. Oh, we just week. opened it up. Okay, that's good. So after the substance will stop working. Uh, it, it won't do the same effect uh, as it used to do before. And as you can guess, the, the person will have to increase the substance over and over. So that's tolerance. Um, uh, and, then, and then the problem is, when the substances get stopped suddenly, it can lead to withdrawal symptoms. And that's because like the body is always trying to develop something called homeostasis. And what that means is the body is always balanced. If you give it a substance like alcohol, for example, if it's sedative, it will stop producing the natural sedative. Um, but then you stop it altogether. Let's say the person decided to quit. Um, that that uh, sedative won't be secreted. It will eventually be secreted. But after a while, but that period could be sometimes painful and sometimes actually fatal. So you develop the withdrawal symptoms and and um, that will lead some people to use more. So you probably like like heard of people talking about like hangover, for example. So the hangover they get after drinking in, in the morning. So that's a type of like a withdrawal symptom, uh, a headache, they get a headache. So some people will just take Advil or take Tylenol and, and sleep it over and, and get over the withdrawal symptoms, but some people might need to take alcohol that time just to get over. So that's a, a lot, uh, like basically a physical dependence on the body. So that's one of the biological consequences that, that, that substance use can lead. And of course, the health consequences is, is a big one. And it depends on what substance that we're using. Uh, is it alcohol and the effect in the liver? Uh, it might cause cirrhosis. Um, it might cause cancers, pancreatitis. Um, we all know the dangers of tobacco and, and the health or, and cancer. Almost every part in the body. Um, cannabis itself. There's very good uh, data of how it affects uh, lung, uh, causing bronchitis. Bronchitis. I mean, sorry, and it can cause infertility. Um, you name it. Stimulant can affect. Uh, the heart can affect the brain, causing stroke or a heart attack. Um, An opioid is is, is um, epidemic. It's causing a lot of death uh, 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 nowadays in North America specifically. Um, and then there's also the psychological and social effect, and it is also part of what we know how we know it's it's a problem. So um, it's very very common. I see how the substances can affect the relationship. 
in the family between between the individual and his uh, or his or her parents, partners, children, relative friends. Um, it, it might go to social factors and affect uh, work or studying. It really has interfered with people's career a lot. Um, and um, it also depends on the substance because if it, if it actually interfere with the judgment, it might make the individual uh, do things that he would not or she would not do when in a normal state of mind, uh, such as abuse, for example, abuse for their family or something else, uh, problem with love, problem with driving, uh, which can have a very long um, uh, consequences, as you can imagine. And the most important uh, factor I want to mention before I end it, sorry, I'm, I'm taking long and <laughs> explaining it, it's just too much to say, it is, the, is part of a biological slash psychological slash social as well, which is um, the psychiatric symptoms that we get after using substance. Um, it is well known that a lot of people are self-medicating. I'm not going to ignore that. I, part of my research is, is I, I, I've seen how people like self-medicate if they already, and self-medicate what I mean is if I have a problem untreated and anxiety, and, and I tried cannabis, for example, and I read it, like I took the I, anxiety area. It's understandable that you will continue. I understand that completely. But after a while, because of what I just described biologically, the changes in your body, it actually contributes to the anxiety. Uh, and the anxiety you, 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 you feel when you stop is not really the anxiety um, because the, the existing anxiety comes. It's actually more of a withdrawal anxiety comes in. So it really complicates things more further. I, I feel this is just uh, an important point that I wanted to, to uh, bring in awareness because, yes, we understand it is a response. But it eventually become a disease and complicate things. And instead of one problem, you have two problems, right? That's what I have to say for that. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Dr. Ahmed, is there anything you wanted to add? No, those are all great points. And that, that, that last point is so important, making the distinction between like substance-induced mental health problems and then mental health problems that are not substance-induced. And then, of course, people with underlying mental health problems are going to have an exacerbation of that once you add substance and do uh, some substances to the mix. So that's such a such an important uh, issue and uh, concept, and it's something that comes up often. So, just to to kind of play off of that last part as well is do you do you find a difference in the substance use or the substance of choice for individuals when it's um, induced by a different mental health disorder or is it kind of just viewed more coping and stuff like that if you don't mind just commenting on that Dr. Ahmed I have you on my screen please go ahead sure yeah I mean I think a lot of the choice to use drugs and alcohol is just based on availability access and then also the people that you're around. So if you have a family member that uses drugs or alcohol, you may, you may be more likely to use that drug or alcohol or vice versa. If you have a parent that was an alcoholic or had alcohol use disorder, you may be averse to that, but then also be prone to using another substance problem. But in terms of just um, mental health problems, meth and stimulants commonly induces psychosis um, and then uh, cannabis is also a culprit. Uh, but, you know, the best way to address mental health issues when substances are involved is to just manage both of them simultaneously. So if you manage one without managing the other one, you just don't get traction. And a lot of times what we'll get is calls from family members who are conceptualizing it just as a mental health problem and the substance use is a peripheral thing or vice versa. Substance use is the problem and the mental health is this peripheral thing, like the anxiety, the bipolar disorder, the psychosis is a peripheral thing. Um, it's only a problem when it's a crisis. And the, the issue is, and the, the important thing is taking this dual diagnosis model where we're managing both things simultaneously. And to that extent, patients' substance use problems along with their medical problems as well. So you have a lot of people with chronic pain who have an opioid use disorder. Both of those things can simultaneously exist. It's not one or the other. I have chronic pain, I don't have an opioid addiction. I have an opioid use disorder, I don't have chronic pain. So once you have both of those, there's treatments exi that exist that 
that address both of those. It's so important to just address comprehensively all of the factors that are involved with a substance use problem, family factors, um, trauma, mental health conditions, drug and alcohol, medical factors, withdrawal, so on and so forth, and addressing them all at once in order for us to get traction on the problem. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, it sounds, you know, I think sometimes it's it's difficult to remember that there's so many complex parts and intersecting um, really parts around a substance use, you know, or a disorder that an individual um, it could be struggling with. So thank you for touching on that. Um, so we kind of wanted to also understand right now what is being used in the field. So you you both kind of work with addiction. What are our evidence based practices and treatments um, that are that you find are working with our with our Muslim brothers and sisters in addiction overall? Dr. Hassan, do you want to join us? Sure. Okay. Um... I thought maybe I'll give Dr. Amir a chance since I stole his first class. <laughs> uh, um, it, there is a variety of treatment, uh, just like how uh, every individual has a different risk factor. Um, we have a, a variety of treatment. Um, we usually, like when when a person present to for help, we tailor the treatment according to their need and where this where which stage are it's just like tailing a suit on uh, the suit the person because if a, a per, if a person is presented for example if a person presented an emergency overdose that's a very completely management as a person that come to the clinic that's have a hard time stopping a substance so it's like it, it really depends on what stage are, are they what they need how motivated even for unmotivated people we have we, we can we can do harm reduction we can we can do uh try to uh, have a conversation that might might enhance their motivation by increasing their awareness of uh of the problem or um what they really want to achieve so so yeah it's a variety of things but in a nutshell um there's medication uh there's some medication that works for certain substances uh such as like we have um, a great medication for alcohol, essential medication for opioid that's actually saved lives. Some uh, other medication for uh, for a variety of uh, other substance of a problem. Uh, we can use it as a, in a as a, a we call anti craving. That's basically like I mentioned earlier when the brain is 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 craving something that's usually suitable for a person who already quit, but struggle to maintain that uh, abstinence so that, that that can work or sometimes I mean we can provide a medication that can help with with um, with uh, withdrawal symptoms that I also mentioned earlier uh, there is therapy uh, um, whether groups or individual and and there is detox center there is a long-term rehab center um, and it's and we we're seeing like fortunately we're seeing more uh, method of delivery. There's virtual, there's individual. Uh, so it really would depend on where's the person, how motivated there is. Uh, again, another example is if the person is struggling with stopping the substance because every time they stop, like, there is a bad withdrawal symptom. So that we see this all the time with alcohol. So um, uh, we, we will have to send to a detox center first. Uh, we deduct from the alcohol, and then the second stage of, of treatment of management. Uh, what was the risk for this person? Okay, let's try to overcome risk. If there is a, uh, a psychiatric illness, exactly like Dr. Amr said, we will have to treat it simultaneously. So it's a variety of ways. So it starts with an assessment, uh, but then it branches out depending on the need, and it's because of the chronic nature, it will require some follow up and some some management as well. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Dr. Ahmed, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, no, I think that's that's excellent. I mean, really, that's so important to highlight for everybody listening that it really starts with the level of motivation that that person's at. So if you have a family member struggling with a drug and alcohol problem, the way that we approach it is that first we assess, is this person even thinking about changing? If Are they locked into place and not even thinking about it? Um, you can think about it like an eggshell. You can the, the chicken isn't even cracking out of the eggshell and looking out. And then are the the next stage would be like are they contemplating it? Okay, maybe they're thinking about 
changing. So they break a little bit of the egg and they peek out and uh, they're, but there are two minds about it. You know, they want to use, but there's also problems that are associated with use, like family problems, so on and so forth. So they're two minded about it. And then there's a stage where they're ready to take action. And then based on all these three stages, we tailor that treatment and family members should recognize that that's also important to tailor their treatment. So if there's somebody that's just not ready to get in treatment, then the family member needs to adjust their strategy in order to, to, to live with that, to deal with that. And then the goal is to then move them to an, another stage of motivation and change. That's certainly how we address it. And, and, and it's, it, it's wise to address it that way for family members as well. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, there's, you know, a comment in the chat, which I think this is a great opportunity to address. And it's, um, are, is taking medication for something like this haram? Like, are we permitted to utilize these medications um, for recovery? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can talk from a perspective, like a medical perspective. And yes. I think it's important to consult people of knowledge. Certainly before I ventured into this field, that's something that I did. And I think that's an important process. All right. So when we talk about medications for cravings like alcohol, that's just a medication. It doesn't affect the mind. It's not causing intoxication. So you have the medications for alcohol that are just reducing your cravings. They've just been shown to reduce cravings. They, for example, naltrexone or a camprosate, or there's another medication called antabuse. Antabuse works by preventing alcohol use. So you take the medication and if you drink on it, you become ill on it. So it's almost like a deterrent. You know, you can't drink, so you don't. You just have to make a decision not to drink once that day by taking that medication because now you can't for the rest of the day. But there's the two better medications, naltrexone and acamprosate are associated with reductions in cravings. They don't affect the intellect. You don't feel a sense of euphoria from it. Um, then there's other medications, and this is important, like for opioid use disorder, opioid addiction, like buprenorphine and methadone. I think the important thing to recognize that when we're talking about these medications, it's important to talk to uh, a medical professional, so an addiction psychiatrist, an addiction medicine, addiction professional, medical professional, and also somebody of knowledge. So the Sharia is very uh, deep. And so it's, you want to get an expert opinion from somebody who can really understand the objectives of the, the Sharia, the foundations of the Sharia, so on and so forth. You don't want to like ask your uncle who reads a lot or something like that. Um, you want to, because it's such a high stake, when you talk about opioids, we're talking about we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic and your you're, the decision you make can be the decision between life and death. So for example, buprenorphine, there is a very important study by some Johns Hopkins researchers that came out a few years ago that showed in a large population that medications like buprenorphine reduce overdose, overdose death risk by 80% versus not taking medications. So when you think about this problem, it's not a problem of about just making it comfortable. It's not about making life comfortable. It's about reducing your risk of death. It's not about preserving the intellect. It's about preserving life. And so when we think about how we need to discuss this problem, certainly from the medical field, we are incredibly, uh, it's, it's incredibly important to use this essential medication for people with an opioid use disorder to stabilize them, treat the withdrawal, treat the cravings, reduce their chance of overdose death risk, and then, um, and then eventually move on with their life and then taper off of it, give, get that opportunity to stay on their medication, develop some coping skills, stabilize. And then the, 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 the driving point, the bottom line is there's so much evidence showing that these medications are important in preserving life across continents, across decades. That's just something that we can't ignore. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. I think that was a very um, important part here. And I have one more for you, Dr. Ahmed, and I know you've touched on this in some of your previous talks on this topic as well. Um, but can you can you talk to us about CBD oil and CBD pills and um, 
any perspective that you have on the, not just like how permissible it might be, but also just giving us an understanding of why might people um, resort to CBD oil or pills, or even I think there are CBD gummies as well. So we're diversifying subhanAllah. Yeah. So a lot of the indications that CBD is marketed towards, there's no evidence for it. So it's, it's not, it's it's not medically valid for a lot of uh, conditions that it's being marketed for now cbd is not psychoactive so you know it's not it doesn't affect the intellect and it has some properties that are helpful on a physiological level so that's something to keep in mind but the other thing you want to keep in mind is that for a lot of the conditions that cbd is encouraged for or marketed towards there's first line medications there's second line medications, there's third line medications, THC, and there's other molecules within cannabis that are, that do affect the intellect, that do cause euphoria. Um, those, um, that's something separate. So, but CBD, what you should keep in mind also is that a lot of these preparations are FDA approved. And when researchers actually test samples of CBD only treatments, some studies show that up to 20% have THC in it. And I can tell you from our clinical experience, we have people uh, in our clinic uh, that we work with, that I work with, that are really stable. We have no reason to believe that they're using THC. They tell us that they're using CBD. These are people that we've come to know over a long period of time. They say they're using CBD um, and, um, and THC shows up in their urine drug screen. So. Um, so it's it's really more so about are you really getting CBD, um, and um, also is it really helping? So those are some questions that you want to you want to ask yourself. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Inshallah, that was a benefit. That was incredible. Um, okay, so I think we're we want to ask. Um, so what treatments? Are there any treatments that exist that are specifically tailored to the Muslim community, or are we kind of working with taking already existing models of treatment and incorporating faith into that? Um, what What do you find? So, Dr. Hassan, what do you find um, yourself turning to in your practice? So, uh, yeah, th this is an area again that need to be. Um, uh, Hopefully invested in by by scientists uh, and, and and clinician, someone can able to to tailor it for the need of the Muslim. Um, in the beginning, like obviously, so so I, I'm doing a practice of like addiction in ambulatory clinic, but not not a big proportion at all are are Muslims, uh, and and so there's many reasons for that could be, but I believe what stigma is one of them. Um, so we that I, I want to start with this beginning because I feel that there's a lot of people on need Muslims are in need but they're not coming for for many, for many stigmatized reason uh, that could be social or cultural or systematic uh, as well. So we started to try to fight that stigma a little bit. Um, stuff like, like the webinars like what we're doing right now. This is great. This is this is excellent. So we we tried to do as much because. And when we get more people, then we will hear more voices, more voices that are able to more tailor. Like without this, it's, it's really um, assuming that this this will work and, and, and might one size fit all. But we know that like everybody needs specific things. Um, so, yes, it is. We, we definitely need more. But we have, the, for example, you heard Dr. Amir saying that we need to treat the, the um the coexist in psychiatric illness with, with this. So if there is a depression, we do have a, a, an Islamically incorporated psychotherapy, which is the, one of the famous ones is, is cognitive behavior therapy. So that can be uh, can be done or, or incorporated. Um, I do know about there is a, so the alcohol anonymous, which is a famous twelve step uh, therapy for treating alcohol. Uh, there has been focus with uh, an Islamic lens into it. It's not that common, at least in, not in Canada, uh, but, but it, it is certainly growing. Um, there is some area like this when it, when it comes to therapy or, or it comes to um, uh, having, uh, yeah, anything with, with the psychology in the beginning. But I feel that 
we should start by the stigma first to get to get people all the awareness, the knowledge, the enhance coming to treatment, and then after that we can we can we can tailor the, some of the the treatment to it. Uh, one of my colleagues, for example, I'll tell you in, in Canada here, so she's doing an excellent um, uh, uh, group about mindfulness only for women in an Islamic based way. Mindfulness can be great use. I know she uses it only for anxiety so far, uh, but mindfulness can be a great tool that will benefit people with addiction. Uh, it helps will regulate a lot of the emotions uh, and stuff. So Me, myself, I uh, doing in a research study, uh, uh, something, uh, 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 a therapy. We call it mantram therapy. So we got it from California, actually. Uh, and then we started to tailor it for people with PTSD and with addiction. Uh, but if you get to look into it, like what actually excites me about this, like you hear everybody almost uh, heard about mantra, and, and what, but when I look deeply into it, this is what we know in the Islam is dhikr. Uh, this is what we've we, been doing historically for many years. And it's just that people have brought it and brought it into scientific way. And now I'm trying to test it for addiction. Uh, and, and mental illness, I'm having great success with it. And people might underestimate, just, oh, they can, I do this all the time, just a few things after prayer in the morning. No, it has a great, uh, if you, we looked into more deeper than it actually helps with the concentration and with the focus. If we do it in the right way, uh, you have to really be using all the mindfulness skills of bringing your attention back to the to the daycare every single time. And if with, we do it over eight weeks to teach people and do it in a certain way. And we have a, I have a portion just specifically for Muslims or for non-Muslims to choose from a uh, well-known uh, daycare that, that can be chosen. So there is a lot of options that we actually can be tailored uh, for this. So uh, I hope that will answer your question. It did. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. And I'm, I'm actually hoping so in the study that you did with the psychoeducational programming at the Masajid, you guys saw pretty high numbers in reduction of stigma among um, community users. Can you tell us a little bit about your study and um, why that finding was so important? And I understand it was just a 90 minute seminar. So, mashallah, I would love to hear a little more about that. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this, yes, it's it, again, it's a, uh, coming back to the point of how uh, like how stigma can really affect the whole community and it's it's it's, it's almost infectious like it, it can be infected from one person to another um and, and uh the problem is it can be fatal sometimes because you can see the more the person doing the substance and not seeking help the more the use to the substance the the chemical the the, the dependence on it which can lead to fatal uh sometimes loss of life if things progress uh, very severely. So um, uh, we, we know there is an issue because there's many, many barriers. So we decided that we do a psychoeducation program that is tailored for Muslim. Uh, so all uh, we incorporated all the Islamic teaching showing how really the current science does not um, contradict what we know with Islam. How they, they actually uh, uh, very much matching something like exactly what doctor we heard in the video that Allah that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal have let no disease but that, that uh, there is a treatment for it. So that's that's an important statement. How there is one uh, companion at, at that time I've seeked out to the, to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he asked, "Oh, can I use this alcohol as a medicine?" He said, "No." It's not a medicine, it's a disease. They call it a disease. Uh, so, so all of this, many with many others, the gradual prohibition of this. So all of the, there is many, many stories in Islam that we can look into it and we incorporate it into the psychoeducation um, with the aim of reducing stigma by enhancing the knowledge for the public about what is addiction and the consequences and the treatment, um, improving the attitude toward people with, with addiction. Uh, th this is an important because uh, you, I've heard many, many times, and I'm sure others have heard that, oh, God, this person, uh, he, he drink wine, the Dorf Iman, this is a weak, weak Iman, weak, weak uh, religion. Uh, and, and they've been linked into this, not, not considering any other factors. Um, and the third factor we try to help people is to help enhance uh, professional help seeking. Uh, so these are, if we're able to manage that. So we went to mosques. Uh, we we uh, we tried different times in Joman after Joman different days um, and uh, Alhamdulillah Allah, there, there was a, a great response and how even people immediately see oh okay 
we, because we tested them before and after and we see how 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 things um, would be different. For example, if uh, uh, an individual show up drunk in the mosque, how we see, how we see that, and they started they they started to look at it uh, in a different way, which can be very helpful for the personal affected. Um, so that's what we did, and we're trying to right now to upscale this. We kind of paused with the COVID and with the pandemic, but uh, we're trying to upscale it a bit to uh, bring it again on a national level. So thank you for bringing this up, Mona. No, of course. I actually had just one more question um, about that is how important did you find was the integration of Islam? So, you know, where when people come to seek, whether it's education around addiction or whether it's, you know, just treatment, how important was it that you and your team of researchers were Muslim and that the, the concepts that you were integrating um, into, into kind of like the medical model of addiction and understanding was also grounded in Islamic fundamentals? So I'll tell you, I, I remember one quote from one participant. Uh, so he or she, I can't remember, or I don't know, uh, said, um, uh, I understand how addiction can affect someone, but with Islamic integration, I understand more uh, and, and it's more clear now. So it, it's, uh, so this is, uh, and it's been 100% like from people, they preferred uh, integration to Islamic. Uh, uh, material into it rather than just presented from a secular or a scientific piece. Uh, so it was, it was, yes, uh, I agree. And, and eventually that's for every practice of Muslim, that's usually what we want to hear or what we want to do. If I, I myself, uh, if I got sick, I usually go to it. Usually go to the doctor or uh, prescribe something for myself and, and take it. But I would also uh, like to read Quran. I'll I'll pray. I'll make uh, a dua for myself. I like to supplement things that are, are happening and ask Allah Azza wa Jal for a cause, which is going to be the medicine or something else uh, that helped me uh, reach shifa. So so um, so we all as Muslims like want this integration because. Our deen is usually not separate from our life. It's it's our life. It's it's so it it, it makes things better for for understanding and enhancing as well. Um, looking things differently and enhancing coming from people. Jazakallah. And um, for those interested in reading um, Dr. Hassan's study, him and his colleagues, we put the um, the link in the chat. Um, so. If you do have academic access, um, if you don't, please send us an email, info at mayorstan.org, and we'll try to support you, inshallah, in getting that paper. Um, Dr. Ahmed, I, we, we want to give you an opportunity. So you're the executive director of the Medina House. If you can tell us a little bit about Medina House and the work that you do there and the impact that you have found so far in that work in the community. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Medina House is a nonprofit organization where we're focused on Two main initiatives. One is recovery housing, so sober living homes. Uh, they're open to the public, but we have a Muslim track uh, for Muslims who are struggling with substance use disorder. So the Muslims that join our homes, we have one home in the Bay Area in Richmond, California, and one home in Chicagoland in Waukegan, Illinois. They're both close to the masjid, and the Muslims that live in those homes utilize the local masjid for um, different classes, like Sira classes, and in other uh, classes that occur in that, that masjid. And we also have uh, gatherings that are based on what is spirituality, what is Islam, how is that integrated into addiction recovery? The second initiative we have is just kind of focusing on this, like how do we address stigma? How do we provide education to the community? So we've done several community workshops. That's on our website. You can check us out, medinahouse.org. Uh, thanks for posting that, yeah. So you can check it out on the on, and there's a in the chat. Um, it's just been posted. Essentially, what you can see is the workshops that we've done in the past. But importantly, one of the initiatives that we've started is um, family classes. So basically, you know, one of the most frequent calls we get uh, from the Muslim community is like family members asking, "What do I do about my loved one?" And so my loved one has an addiction, they're using marijuana, they have a drug problem. How do I help them? They don't want help. Like for example, in my day job at Stanford at the hospital where we have a catchment where we see the whole community, 
you know, we'll talk with people and it's usually the individual themselves coming to us for help. Um, and when we are working with uh, the broader community through this nonprofit organization, it's usually the individual themselves coming for help. Uh, but when with our community outreach in the Muslim community at, at Medina House, the calls in the Muslim community are all from family members. And so we talk to their family, we talk to the individual with addiction. Individual with addiction is like not motivated at all to treatment. And so, like we mentioned before, our interventions in this is all tailored to the stages of change that that person's in. So if you have a family member who has an addiction and is not motivated to treatment, uh, then the, your next play as a family member is to focus on what you can change. And you know what, what we see is when family members go from what should I control to what can I tr control, they start to gain traction. So as opposed to what should I control, should I control talking to them like this, or you know, they're doing this with their schooling or their work, or should I give them this ultimatum, so on and so forth. When they move from that to what can I control, and they realize that really it's themselves that they can control, that's when we see people get traction. So what we do at this family class, we have this family class, it's virtual, it's open to anybody. Um, it's on Thursdays. It's open to Muslims. It's specifically for Muslims struggling with um, a family member that has addiction. We use a specific intervention called CRAFT. We use this intervention because it's. we just looked at the interventions out there. We looked at the literature. We looked at what has the best numbers behind it. And CRAFT had the best numbers behind it. So what we essentially do is we break the class up into three parts. One, one is a foundational concept. Uh, in Islam that leads into what we're about to talk about. Then the second concept is um, we go into like an evidence-based intervention, like what is enabling, how to set boundaries, so on and so forth. And then we open the rest of the class up to questions, question and answer. So, you know, one of the issues we face is we have people that are motivated. They're at a point where it's like, they're, they're like, I don't care about saving my face. I just want to save, save the situation. Then they come, they take the, the leap and they, they show up to the virtual classes. Uh, but then we have other people that are, you know, at a, at a place where they're just not ready for that. And that's completely fine. We've all been there. And so what we're offering for, for those people is we just live stream our classes. They just come to our website. They listen to the first portion of the class, see what we're about. And when the time comes, if they want to enter to the class, they can absolutely come to the class. So they can find details of that in the recovery homes on our website. And, and that's sort of some of the efforts we're trying to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. And I, I do wanna ask if you don't mind giving us perhaps a few practical um, areas for, there's a lot of questions around, you know, my loved one doesn't wanna seek help or there's a lot of shame in seeking help too. You know, somebody um, started an addiction a decade ago and now is has seen their life just pass by and it's too late for me and my time is gone. And um, how do we, any advice for family members when you're saying, you know, what, when you can control, you can really only control yourself. What are some steps that family members can take? And if you have any kind of words of advice for folks who feel like their time for recovery is past. Yeah. So I, I would say that, you know, it's never too late. It's never too late. We, we see people that we think are really early on in their addiction and that, you know, it's very treatable and they don't make it. And then we see people that are really towards like the end of their progression on the spectrum of, of substance use disorder and they make it simply because they have more motivation. And so, you know, and then the vice versa is true. I think the most important thing is to focus on what you can control. And family members that focus on um, the topics that have been shown to help motivate their loved one do well. So the main question people have is, how do I get my loved one sober? And that's the question that, that we try to address in this class. And then there's classes that exist, you know, that, that address this, like Smart Recovery has um, a family class, um, and they have an online program. You have Al-Anon that has family classes. Um, and um, and they have that MCC, uh, a, a mustard in the Bay Area, in the East Bay, ha actually has these classes in the mustard. They're, ho they're housed in the mustard. It's a really amazing, uh, innovative work. 
But um, the, the number one thing people can do is start educating themselves and how did they disable the addiction as opposed to enabling the addiction. Because a lot of the stories we hear uh, when people call in from all over, from every different background and uh, you know, every different substance, a lot of the conversations are from people who are unconsciously enabling the addiction. They're creating the perfect circumstances for addiction to thrive. And um, with a little bit of education, they start to make traction. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, I think before we head into Q&A, I did want to just pose this final question to both. Uh, sorry, Dr. Hassan, did you want to add something? I just wanted to uh, say to Dr. Armin, mashallah, Jazakallah khair for this amazing work. This is exactly what I think uh, we need in the community. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that support. Actually, you know, Dr. Ahmed, just to recap, are your services open to folks in Canada as well? Can people, um, I know you said they were virtual. Or yeah, that- yeah. So the, the community workshops, we, we they're mostly been done in the Bay Area, in Chicagoland, because that's, that's where our recovery homes are. But the um, there we have a lot of them recorded and online. Um, and you can see them at our website. And then the family classes are virtual. So Anybody can, you know, from any any country, any state can join. We have people from all over the U.S. right now, but not uh, not other countries. But of course, they're welcome to come as long as they have internet connection. And then our recovery homes, they're in the Bay Area in in Chicago, but you know, people are welcome to come from out of state um, and from other areas in that state. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Inshallah, we will all keep Medina House in our du'as and, and, and pray for its, you know, thriving and like benefit to the community base. And, uh, um, all right. So I think before we go into Q&A, just to kind of um, wrap up our incredible discussion today, it's what do we do? You know, like folks who are in the community who are seeing this, we might have loved ones, you know, mashallah, there's 75 participants in the room right now how can we support um and we'll we'll kind of just keep you know just kind of more closing remarks so that I, I make sure to get to some of the q a from our participants but any words that kind of come to mind or pieces of advice for folks who are just like you know i want to support this but I'm, I'm at a loss as to how i even get started <laughs> dr hassan do you maybe want to start us off I was gonna give to I was gonna give it to Dr. Hammer since this is one of the main hot topic, and definitely it is um, uh, at, at, like a, a big question um, that that even I get asked. I would say once every two weeks we get a call of what can I do, what can I do uh, to, to to this, um, and then it just tells how much of uh, when an individual is effective, it affects the whole family, uh, and and. Uh, it's it's a it's it's a really a problem that that if we get together and just to fix it, I think we can we can uh, make a, a big improvement and big change in, in the field. Um, general advice: if if you have, have it's really have to be patient and persistent. <laughs> patient but persistent. You gotta you gotta keep uh, um, being persistent on trying to help the patient to get to treatment because that's the, the, the first thing, the, the motivation uh, into in get the assessment, get to speak to someone, basically get help. Um, but being patient, meaning no call and names. Uh, one of the big things is what we try to do is destigmatize. That can also happen in the home, like avoid using the word junkie or even addict or any, any, any word of that. Um, uh, it's very clear, and that's also matching our our Quranic and our Islamic teachings. No, no people shall ridicule other people or call them names. This is very clearly present in the Quran. So, um, even having a condition like that does not help. Uh, you have to be uh, looking into the, their point of view. I had to try to understand what is it that that keep attracting them into these substances, and then trying your best. Uh, for get them, I would say that the best that the mission is to get them into into uh, into treatment, and then maybe we can uh, initiate the rest or, or initiate a, a little bit of a break from the substances, get them to 
to to see the the positive and and the, the benefit out of it. Um, that yes, yeah, this, this is this is one of one of the main things. But it depends again in where where they at. Are they actively using every day? What substances? How many substances? Um, there there's general advice uh, about that. But uh, as I mentioned, just be careful because. Uh, not every individual and they're in the same level. They might be so, their body is so dependent on it and just pulling your socks and leave it and lock the door on him, that can be actually more harmful than than doing good. So, uh, but I'm sure Dr. Amir has uh, better advice than, than mine. I don't know about that, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the community working together. I mean, we have such an amazing community we have medical professionals, we have therapists, we have life coaches and peer mentors, we have people with lived experience who have gone through this and survived it. We have imams and religious leaders and chaplains. We have crisis lines. We have so much infrastructure. I think the important thing is that this is a problem that's not going away and it's going to continue to get worse. There's no there's no, it's not in the horizon. It's not looking like it's getting better. It's looking like it's getting worse. So I think it's important for us to, to work together. I don't think any of us can do this individually and everybody has a part to play and working together to address this problem is going to be key. And I think the way that we, uh, we talk about this, I totally agree that we need to address the stigma around this and that that can really be done just through a lot of education. So people may think, you know, why, why should we not stigmatize drug and alcohol use? It's bad. I think what we're talking about is something different here. What we're talking about is when the drug and alcohol use gets out of control, that person wants to stop, but they can't they want help. Um, they're looking to us for help. And, you know, they have a lot of these, things that have led them to a drug problem. I think that's where we need to step in and show that compassion and then get them connected to all the help that's out there within our community, um, outside of our community, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, working together and um, embracing people with this problem and getting them into treatment, embracing them, people with this problem, it does not mean enabling them. So somebody that doesn't want help it's important that we help to disable that addiction. We don't want to somebody that comes to the mustard looking for money and have a drug problem. We don't want, we, we don't want to give them money. Maybe we can help them find a job. Maybe we can nudge them towards treatment. Maybe we can nudge them towards something that's going to be able to, to help them. Um, so we want to um, embrace them, get them into treatment and then getting that embracing them doesn't mean necessarily enabling their, their addiction. Michelle, I thank you both so much for, you know, kind of just the support. Um, SubhanAllah, I think there's there's a lot of work as a community we have to do. And um, I want to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to just piggyback Dr. Ahmed. You know, this is kind of you, you've spoken to you and Dr. Hassan, the importance of standing behind work like the Medina House or continuing to do research on this topic. And um, why is it important for us to constantly have data on Muslim populations? And a lot of questions revolve around, um, you know, a lot of the questions that we're getting is like, well, what is out there for Muslims? Or, you know, kind of, we want more resources in more areas. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm glad to see the chat uh, kind of going going off with just various resources. So please making sure that you're looking at the chat and if it's in an area that you live in, uh, reaching out and utilizing those services, but also supporting those services um, when feasible and in any way that you can to ensure the longevity of this work. I think um, collectively as a panel, we know the work that we all do, um, whether it's in addiction or mental health, we want to kind of last beyond us and our years in the field, you know, subhanAllah, we want this to be um, to be available for, for our kids and their kids and ongoingly. And like Dr. Ahmed touched on, this isn't necessarily going away. So um, almost in a way, the sooner we we can back work like this and the sooner there's like this communal realization of where we are, um, the more we can work together, inshallah, with, you know, one hand and one um, kind of achievable goal, bi'iznillah, to, to support Muslim brothers and sisters dealing with this. So thank you um, for that. 
So I think I'll turn to some of the questions in the Q&A box, mashallah. There's a lot of people and a lot of questions about this. And um, one of the questions that I'm sure you you both get in your work as well is more like behavioral addictions. Is that something you come across? Um, is it the same? Is, is the psychology behind um, or the psychiatry behind uh, behavioral addiction similar? I don't know if um, one of you prefers to take the question over the other, but please feel free. I can also just pick some. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the principles with behavioral addictions are similar to chemical addictions. So, you know, um, you have peer support groups for behavioral addictions. You have professional treatment for behavioral addictions. And you have uh, medications for some behavioral addiction. So those three dimensions of treatment still come into play with behavioral addiction. And it's interesting in the Quran, Allah says, yes, alunaka anil khamar wal maysir. This is so fascinating that gambling, which is now recognized as a as an addiction, it wasn't previously, um, is, is recognized as an addiction. And then intoxicants like chemical intoxicants. There's a connection between that. And in other areas in the Quran, there's a connection between that, which is really fascinating. Because if you think about it, we've just sort of come to start recognizing uh, gambling as an addiction. I think clinically, we've always recognized gambling, pornography as an addiction. But, you know, um, even in our uh, diagnosis and categorization of now gambling addiction is, is considered uh, an addiction. All right. So what, how do you treat that? So you have many behavioral addictions, pornography addiction, and then, um, you know, uh, gambling addiction sort of being the, the, the common addictions. And now with the prevalence of the internet, uh, you know, that's, that's changing the way all addictions are, are panning out specifically internet uh, pornography addictions and um, gambling addictions. So, you know, I think the best advice I can give in a concise way is that, you know, a lot of times people will approach these behavioral addictions with this um, attempt at just phasing out of it. So, for example, with... Um, pornography addiction that you know it's something that people try to phase out of or marry out of and that and what i find is when people conceptualize it as an addiction with some of the same risk factors that a chemical addiction would have and with the same gravity of 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 um of the situation and with the same um approach to treatment then they can make a lot of traction so for example with like professional like treatments that would be something like CBT or um, um, a mindfulness-based interventions for pornography addiction. And you have people that specialize in, in this area. And then for peer support groups, you have 12-step groups and other peer support groups for pornography addiction and other gambling and other behavioral addictions. And then the third dimension would be medications. You can explore those medications. You know, those medications don't require specialists to prescribe. You can explore them, learn about them, and then come prepared to your primary care doctor's visit and let them ask them about getting on some of these medications. Or you can see somebody that's trained in addictions. But yeah, gambling, uh, I'm sorry, behavioral addictions are a serious problem. Uh, they cause a lot of um, distress in people's lives. And uh, when you conceptualize it in, as an addiction, it can be really helpful to start gaining traction on the problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Um, Dr. Hassan, the next question that we have in the box is, um, can you speak to towards any gender differences in addiction? Any is there like a stigma within a stigma when we look at specific genders? So specifically, the question touched on um, women and females who are struggling with an addiction. Um, did you do you know if there's more stigma surrounding that due to it being perhaps a less acceptable behavior for women over men? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... So historically speaking, and the way when we teach medical students and, and uh, et cetera, academically, um, so substances have uh, been always uh, more in men than women. 
uh, um, maybe for a variety of reasons of how scenes, availability, access, uh, um, the, yeah, the, 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 the groups uh, they wanted to fit in several reasons. But there is, uh, and one, now I'm going to speak about the epidemiology, like the, from the prevalence part. Uh, there is concern in the report of actually, because I've seen it, well, now I'm talking about more Canada now with uh, legalization of, of cannabis, the more access, more availability, where actually that gap is closing down. So, so there are more female are equal to male, which is kind of a concern because... Again, now it comes to the why is it a concern? Biologically, there could be some difference in 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 how the gender, how it play a role of the intoxication. So, for example, um, women in general easily get intoxicated than men if they drink the same amount. That has to do with a lot of the metabolisms, about the distribution of fat, distribution of body muscles, a, a lot of a lot of things. So, if you get intoxicated easily um it 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 might lead to, obviously to the biological consequences are helpful so that this is this is myself but there's also a term called telescoping uh in in, in in medicine and what that means is that women when they initiate a substance the easy so that gap from initiation until the development of a, a problem of substance is much shorter in, in women than men so this is a problem so if you more initiating more repetition you can go into jump into a problem very quite easily and it has to do with a lot of factor including um the vulnerability that already exists for like stress or how to tolerate stress or maybe they develop the depression okay again as, as we spoke earlier with dr Hammer, i will need more of that dr drink or more of the substance just to keep it going and just to avoid that which can lead to a bigger problem and problem so um yes it's 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 a it's a big it's a big uh issue there is changes epidemiolog epi epidemiological and we can see it um and it really need to be addressed so that's why i will i will emphasize on a key factor is psychoeducation and dr Anna has touched on it and i cannot agree more especially when it comes to this because uh there might be a lot of misconceptions no 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 i'm saying it's only only in boys, we can try many times. It's, no, 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 it, it can really lead to a lot of significant problems and actually much more, much more in a faster way. So we have to be very cautious and uh, aware of this problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Dr. Ahmed, was there anything you wanted to add specifically to that question? Oh yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Oh, that's great. All right. So I think we'll we'll end with one more question. And, you know, I think a lot of the things that we hear is in order to get to some of these catered programs, you know, there's very high costs involved with any recovery programs. And at times it is going to come at the requirement of a, phys a primary care physician referral. Um, and so how can we do you guys have, you know, mashallah, both MDs, is there any advice for um, non-psychiatrists or other um, physicians who have not specialized in addiction on the reduction of stigma to support actual follow through with referrals to clients um, to, to seek out care um, like you both have kind of you do in your everyday life, really? Yeah, I think physicians play an important role when it comes to addiction. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that physicians can do themselves. So a lot of these medications that require, uh, that, that are helpful for substance use disorder that have been shown to reduce cravings, they don't need a specialist to prescribe them. They just need um, somebody who's um, interested. And um, we have residents that come on our service. They learn how to prescribe all these medications within a week or two. Um, and they, they really do a great job. I'm always surprised with just such a short exposure to it how much they learn and how much they're able to incorporate into their primary care practice uh, and, and all their practices. We have primary care doctors, we have infectious disease doctors that incorporate this into their treatment, emergency department doctors that incorporate this into their, into their usual treatment. So physicians themselves can provide this really important piece, which is that medication management. About two to 3% of doctors can actually go ahead and prescribe medications for opioid addiction in the um, in the, in California and like 70% of rural areas don't have access to, to opiate addiction medications. So it, you know, that's one huge 
place where physicians can help. There's a, there is a tradition of medicine and healing within our tradition and within Islam. There's a lot of Muslim doctors, so they, they can really play a part here. Second for, uh, part of that question of like, how can we um, refer people to treatment? You know, the healthcare system in a lot of ways does not incentivize time with the patient, but with substance use disorder, I, it, it's, it's what I would encourage is, you know, um, coming at it with a non-judgmental attitude, with empathy, asking open-ended questions about their substance use, um, and then trying to build rapport with, with your patient. And then, um, just affirming any progress they've made. So if they made the decision to discuss it with you, you know, affirming that, cheerleading that, you know, praising that. And if they've made any progress to reduce their substance use, cheerleading that, praising that. And that can really, you know, serve to open up the conversation more. And then what I meant by the healthcare system really not providing a lot of time for uh, addressing addiction, you know, what you want to do with somebody who then does open up to you about this conversation as a physician, you can set up a separate appointment just to do a brief intervention uh, or uh, do motivational interviewing or just have a conversation around their sub or, you know, a conversation around medication management around their substance use disorder. And the physician can absolutely take a part in playing with this uh, 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 take a part in, in nudging that, that patient towards getting into treatment. So in that visit, uh, you can uh, work towards uncovering the problem because it does take time and a conversation to uncover the problem, uh, the extent of the problem, uh, and set up follow-up visits, and then also dedicating a visit towards organizing treatments. If you have a social worker in the community, great. If, in, your, in your clinic, if you have a social worker in your clinic, great. Um, handing them off to the social worker. Otherwise, um, you know, helping that patient navigate into how to get into treatment. We have a little bit of information on this on our website. Uh, it's a lengthy conversation about how you help people navigate into treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Hassan, anything you wanted to add? No, that's excellent. Well, uh, yes, um, destigmatize, initiate treatment and referral. Key things. Okay, well, alhamdulillah, um, I think we wanted to, I know it's seven o'clock, we just wanted to um, allow both of you um, a minute to make a closing dua for us um, and everybody in their room and everybody kind of struggling with this incredible issue, whether it's themselves, their families, uh, you know, overall the community we know is struggling. Um, for those who are able to view the screen right now, we've put up some resources. Um, we've also dropped a lot of them in the chat. So please make sure that you've gone through that. But um, Dr. Hassan, did you want to go ahead and get us started with that? Okay. Thank you. I will, it, I will give it a shot. No problem. So um, well, maybe I'll, I'll do that in, in uh, Arabic and then English. Is that okay? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Salam ala Rasulullah. Allahumma jaal jama'na hada jama'a Allahumma jaal jama'na hada jama'a mubarakan. اللهم زدنا علما اللهم نسألك علما نافع ونعود بك من علما لا ينفع اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم عن كل أب أو أم أو أخ أو أخت أو ابن أو ابنة اللهم وفق بين قلوب المسلمين على ما تحب وتطلب والله make uh, all our gathering a blessed gathering um, uh, increase uh, enhance our knowledge uh, the knowledge that benefits us and benefits our community and pleases you, Allah. Uh, oh Allah, may I bring shifa and cureness for every individual and any individual affected, whether by addiction or any other illness. May Allah be uh, in support for any father, any mother, any brother, any sister, any son or any daughter uh, who has um, a loved one affected with us. Uh, and may Allah bless our meeting and our, the knowledge we we trying to to pass on to people. I mean. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Nasaluka al-afwa wal-afia fi dunya wal-akhira. Oh Allah, we ask you to uh, give our community well-being 
and protect our community and keep us safe. Allahumma wafiqna lima tuhibu wa tarabba. Allah, we ask you to create the circumstances for those of us that are struggling with this problem, families and individuals with addiction. We ask you to cure them. We ask you to help them, guide them along their steps. Allahumma arina haqqan haqqa wa rizukna tiba'a wa arina batila batila wa rizukna jtinaba. Allah, we ask you to um, help us be honest with ourselves, honest about this problem, and honest about what's within our control to fix this problem and help us focus on things we can control uh, and grant us the wisdom to know the difference between what we can control, what we can't control. Oh Allah, help us with connections, help us guide us to people who can help and uh, family members who can help, community members who can help. Um, to help heal us from this problem. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifu wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.